founder and director of Palmist Fresh, uh, which is a food company, horticultural uh, uh, firm. And, uh, we are involved both in primary uh, production of horticultural crops, uh, right through to the processing and export of the packaged uh, uh, crops through to South Africa and to Europe and soon to Asia and others in other also to the processing of horticultural uh, crops. Um, my background uh, is in financial services out of all things. Um, I, uh, I worked in Goldman Sachs for a while, uh, in, uh, both in the equities and in uh, trading, trading at JR, one uh, uh, But I've grown up in a very agricultural family. My father had been the first black uh, manager of the Shikipane Estates in Zimbabwe in 1964 and was part of the team that, that built up um, uh, the first, the second ethanol plant in the world in, in Zimbabwe at the time. So always very involved in growing it, so I always had an implicit uh, interest in it. And uh, yeah, and just uh, the whole food equation and what's going on in Africa, the growing middle class, and the coming you know, of international brands which require uh, certain best practices in terms of food processing. Uh, you know, I just saw these opportunities as I was going back. And, uh, yeah, that's been pretty much the, the story. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Simo, I guess we should probably start with you. So it's appropriate. I'm getting hungry again after listening to you talk with uh, you know, um, energy in either the form of uh, food or in the form of is needed to enable uh, socioeconomic and economic growth on the continent. So can you, from your, uh, from where you're sitting, give us uh, your perspective on the types of opportunities that you're seeing in the agricultural industry and what parts of, uh, of Africa these opportunities are most relevant? Uh, sure. Um, you know, for the most part at the moment, I think um, the opportunities are localized certain areas. You know, we might say, you know, the whole thing, you know, we are uh, put all this land, all this water and it's an Indian for of food. Um, and with a lot of institutional funds coming in to invest in agriculture and unlock that value. You know, uh, you, you see that they tend to be making Middle Eastern funds which are coming in to maybe Sudan or anywhere else, uh, or into flowers or something of that sort, uh, to feed their own nations. Right. So it's not really serving the purposes of so, uh, the Africans on the ground. And yet if we find that uh, opportunities which are localized within specific cities around metropolitan areas, whether it be around Nairobi, around Harare, around Mubashi, right, uh, huge opportunities. You know, prices of vegetables there are uh, sort of three times the market value and they're importing frozen fries from Belgium to be consumed in, uh, in the Mubashi and bringing in tomatoes from Belgium and France to be consumed in Dakar. If you go to Dakar, you'll see that, right? So, um, you know, people have the income, they have the taste uh, for the product, but then uh, we have not been doing a very good job of sort of creating uh, the complementary industries in those areas to feed those people. So I think we should try to just go for a niche then. I mean, you can go to any city and you'll find this. But uh, the fantasy are also pretty uh, pretty wild based on those issues. Okay, uh, and, uh, Tuma, can you chime in on, on this uh, issue as to, you know, you go to a lot of these different conferences. I was just at the Harvard one uh, not so long ago, and the uh, Minister of Finance from Nigeria spoke about their cultural opportunity as well as wrapping across uh, Sub Saharan Africa. Um, but, you know, what, what type of areas would you ask uh, people in this type of institution and in, in the Carolinas to think about uh, uh, looking at? The thing is, uh, <coughs> uh, if you know Africa and the structure of the agriculture industry, you will appreciate the challenge of uh, transforming it into enterprise agriculture, where you can commercialize the transaction because the food that people grow, they also consume. 
for the easy subsistence uh, aspect of, of uh, African agriculture, where people basically uh, 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 use the farm as a basis to feed themselves, not to be engaged in the contractual market, <coughs> in the trading. So some of the wheat that is consumed in Africa, in the show it comes in countries, uh, it's a, a, a on the exchange, you may find a company called Seaboard Corporation, Robert Cargill, Robert Dreyfus, are the big uh, trading companies. They are the people who move African agriculture. They make a lot of money out of it. Uh, but Africans are not participants in the commercial agriculture uh, industry. So from the trading side, your capital intensive. So it's not really food business. It's, it's uh, the financing of agriculture produces outcomes that are crops. And if you don't finance, you don't get the outcome. So there is a relationship. So Africans in mine are soon parted, so we are not good friends with money. So the difficulty is that in the supply chain of agriculture, there is a gap in terms of participation. So that's why if uh, today you would uh, set up a fund just to support the farmers, you probably be the richest person in Africa. There is money to be made. And the, uh, because the stomach uh, <laughs> requires food and on a continuous basis. So it's not like gold that you have to ship out. So the, the, and the biggest challenge in Africa is logistics. There are 54 countries. And the biggest benefit is that the left can't talk to the east in terms of road, trail, whatever. And in terms of air, uh, you sometimes have to go to Europe to come into Africa. So logistically, Africa is not a not structure to support uh, a, a dynamic agricultural industry. So one has to look at the whole total construction of Africa. And look at the investment requirement. You are privileged to be at a university that traces its origin from people in agriculture and uh, tobacco and this place and a lot of tobacco and building white chapel and the other things. But so you just take that four corners and uh, uh, look at how agriculture and individuals. So we don't have uh, Washington do, we don't have a James do, we have peasants uh, like uh, a battle with the infantry, no generals. So we don't have people who can combine capital. So if you look at Simba being having been to Wall Street, uh, these are the guys who should now uh, be the wholesalers of opportunities for Africa. Being able to think beyond <coughs> one commodity and being able to put together stories with you uh, as students because you need jobs when you leave the university. So you may find that there is a lot of money uh, but it requires a face of agriculture. So we're excited that uh, I think just uh, simple getting into that giving a face to the horticultural industry where most blacks are not engaged in that sector. Keep so. so I thank you very much for that. Um, <coughs> so for given your your investment premise and what took you into Africa in the first place. Well I want to answer the agriculture. I'm gonna look at it from a completely a macro and a micro perspective. I actually think Africa of the next 30, 50 years will be a very important component into uh, global agriculture. Malthus has been completely wrong. Um, 
as always said, the population will grow exponentially, and land uh, uh, is limited. Uh, and we have proven wrong for uh, technology. What is agriculture all about? Does anybody know what agriculture really is all about? Some people may say soil, seeds, water. You don't have any water, and a tremendous amount of it, fresh water, you don't have any agriculture. Agriculture is all about the movement of water. And we have a big problem with fresh water around the world. In this country, in the West, Hoover Dam was not meant to support what we have uh, west of the Rockies. Uh, China's got about 27 years left of water, fresh water. Um, the Saudis have used all their underground aquifers. What's an aquifer? Fossil water. Think of it like oil. It's not a replacement. I'm not talking about well water that gets refilled by rain. This is ancient water. They have used the Colorado River every year to promote their wheat. And now that water is now gone. So, where is their water? Well, Sub Sahara Africa has certain parts. I mean, Kenya is an example where the flower business has been really sucking dry um, Lake Navasha and, uh, and other areas. But there's plenty of rain, there's plenty of freshwater rivers. Plenty of aquifers. In addition, there's plenty of virgin land in which to grow it. Uh, and therefore, the natural growth place will be Africa. Now, you, you look at land in South America and North America, everybody's getting into, uh, into uh, agricultural land. I'm sure your endowment has investments in, in Iowa land, which is trading at ridiculous prices because of the price of corn and, and others. What's the problem in Africa? Well, the problem in Africa is unless you live on the coast, whatever, there is absolutely no infrastructure to move equipment or move crops. And a lot of this land has never been tilled. Uh, there's no drainage. There's no um, irrigation to have several seasons. And that requires a lot of money. Um, now, you've, I'm sure you guys have read about land grabbing and all that. Well, most of this is it's garbage. Um, the UN, which has been involved in agriculture for the last uh, 50 something years, has been a disaster. Uh, I mean, nothing has changed. Um, investment can actually make the difference. Now, most countries, African countries, as both have brought up, do not need to export. Zimbabwe used to be the breadbasket of Africa until well, we all know what happened there. But, um, but many of these other countries can be uh, breadbaskets. But right now, crops are selling for, in Uganda, for instance, the price of corn for maize trades a little bit over the world market. Go 300, 400 kilometers in, it trades with three times the world market. Now, if I'm growing corn, why in hell would I export corn to Uganda for market price when I can sell it domestically for three times? Um, part of the problem is making sure I get the equipment there on time, because if I don't, I lose the whole growing season. And part of it is also governance. And then the question then becomes, um, distribution. How am I going to get that crop to market? Uh, who's the procurer? And it becomes a very complicated thing. And uh, becoming a farmer doesn't necessarily guarantee you that you're going to make a lot of money. Uh, there's a lot of farm equipment that just sits there and so forth. There is a ton of money from development organizations that are going into Africa on agriculture. And the results are horrible. The yields are zero. They're not getting anything. And the problem is that they don't understand their local uh, governments. Part of it is a very complicated issue in terms of the government, the governance uh, of these countries. Um, but eventually, the answer must lie 
uh, in Africa because the Middle East needs it, China needs it for sure, um, and many other parts of the world are running out of water. So. Awesome. Um, so, you know, s sitting here in North Carolina, um, I I've, I've pondered this question for a little while is how do I encourage um, my classmates and individuals uh, in the region? To, to take a serious step to start you know, partnering with people from the region um, to actually start developing models and real systems that can take advantage of these opportunities. Now, there, there are certain issues, as you already mentioned, governance being one of the key issues, but how do we stop people from being scared about taking advantage of uh, opportunities in agriculture and energy in Africa? Why are they scared? You, you, you guys are in business school, right? You want to make money? Uh, I guess that's why most people are here. If there's opportunity, you take it. Agriculture is clearly an opportunity. I mean, there's, there's money for it. I have turned away money because, I mean, the, the governor of one of the states where I have land, I, you know, he's a thug. And he'll just take <laughs> what I have. The IFC will give you money. Uh, the, all the development funds in Europe will have money. I know tons of people setting up uh, funds. Set up a fund. Go, go raise money from this. Get some people experts on agriculture. Get yourself some agricultural land. You'll get it cheaply. Uh, you bring some equipment in and so forth. And you know the best thing is that if you fail, nothing's going to happen to you. Uh, and you're, most of you are, all of you are all fairly young with that. It's okay to fail. And the good thing about the IFC is they, they don't care. <laughs> so. Um, I don't see why you need to twist anybody's arm. It sits there. Do you have anything to, to add on that? How have you been able to, I guess, coming from Wall Street, how did you take the plunge back into the continent? How have you bridged uh, the gap between here and uh, It's a good question. Um, you know, I attended uh, events such as this uh, from 2003. And there's one particular story that inspired me of, uh, of a Kenyan who worked at uh, <coughs> Hewlett Packard or something of that sort, had gone to UMass, um, and in 1999 or 2000, he left one of these technologies. He left Lucent Technologies. Lucent, I think. It's not bankrupt or something of that sort. I can't remember. But, uh, and then he went to join East African Cables in Kenya. It was a listed firm uh, at the time, 1999, uh, and then when he came to one of these conferences, he was presenting at the Wharton African Business Conference. So uh, I think it was 2003 or 2004. So anyway, he's presenting, and I'm sort of sitting in the back, uh, and <coughs> starts saying, "Oh well, you know, now recent technology, no, now East African cables is worth 300 million dollars on the uh, Nairobi uh, stock exchange. Now, you know, uh, market cap is now the highest in the you know, East Africa." Oh, well, well, wait a minute, this doesn't add up. This guy's only just come, uh, come out of business school a few years ago. Uh, it's 2003, whatever. There's no way this guy could have built a, you know, sort of increased the market from 8 million to 300 to million in three years. But what had happened in Kenya at the time, that's when sort of the technology from the African boom started, right? And this guy, uh, apparently, you know, he had you know, he'd been laid off on uh, from this tech bubble. And it just moved, you know, to, 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 sort of to, to Kenya. And just the tides brought him up. You know, went to find a company that was listed, was running it, and next thing you know, it's worth $300 million. So <laughs> I remember saying to myself, this guy can't be that much smaller than me. <laughs> I'm just being plainly honest. I said, you know what? This guy can do it. Me, I can do it. And uh, uh, believe it or not, uh, uh, you know, uh, that was it. So I remember saying, well, in 2003, 2004, by then, the valuations for sort of African companies were at a huge premium. And you know, any entry to Africa was just ludicrous at the time. So I was looking at multiples, regional multiples, and multiples, like, no, no, they, you know, uh, I can't be going into something that's trading at 25 uh, you know, times earnings at the moment. It's just not making any sense. Your, your assumptions for growth are just wrong. So I remember saying, well, you know, I'm just going to go I'll work on Wall Street, blah, blah. But the next time you have sort of some market calibration, downwards, back to mean, or however you want to term it, you know, it doesn't matter what I'm doing. I'm just going to quit my job and move back. And so after 2008, and I started, and I, you know, I was working for Goldman Sachs and Equities at the time, and uh, 
know, and so I, I, I had a clear window into what was going on, right? And I, I, and I remember, you know, I remember that, uh, you know, firstly you had the movement in, 2000, in, in, in sort of August of 2008, and then again the, the big one in October, November. And I remember celebrating on the trading desk on 50, and, and everyone thinking I'm crazy. In my mind, that, that, that was it, I was moving back. You know, and for me that was it, uh, and um, and sort of just uh, no, sort of packed my bags and went with no real agenda, not knowing what I was going to do. I just knew there was opportunities, knew I could do something, but I had, I had no clear idea. I'm not going to pretend that I had this vision. Fortunately, I, I had a history in agriculture you know, through, through my family and so forth, and uh, they so happened to be in Zimbabwe at the time, uh, which we dollarized uh, from the Zimbabwe dollar to the US dollar. And because of translation uh, you know, rates were, were skewed and legacy costs, historical legacy costs tied to labor, a lot of, country, a lot of companies went through bankruptcy and lost other reasons. And I literally went and sat sort of by the high court where they do all the liquidations uh, as some distressed asset you know, fund guy, which I'm not, but you know, it's just natural to do that you know, because opportunities are there. And you know, farm companies that were, were, were distressed, had gone through bankruptcy, but had the potential to have you know, be, 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 be leverage them up. And they most of them so happened to be agriculture. And, and that was the start. So it, 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 it wasn't pretty, it's not some sort of linear uh, uh, growth model or anything of that sort. It's just understanding that opportunities exist in Africa, got to go after them. And the, so the most helpful component of this were the relationships I had. Primarily with Africans, believe it or not, uh, back when I was in college, back when I was school. Because now in Africa, Africans are starting to invest in Africa. Now, this never used to happen before. But now I call my friend up in Lagos, my friend up in Joburg, my friend in Nairobi, and they're on the next plane now uh, you know, to, to come and look at what I'm doing. And that's quite exciting. What's the value of the country now? Just Africa? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, the, the, the issue of agriculture is. Uh, very important, um, but uh, the issue of energy, I think, is uh, equally um, as important. Uh, so tied to this whole story of moving back, uh, every time I've uh, spoken with my parents about it, you know, they ask me, they go, uh, so when are you moving back? And I'm like, ah, you know, what are we going to uh, have fluid electricity? You know, and, <laughs> and every time you get back, it's a scary thing. You know, you're in Lagos 90% uh, of the day. If you have the ability to, you're running your own diesel generator. And it costs a lot of money. Sometimes the black market goes crazy and they start charging you exorbitant prices. So can you, um, as people that have lived on the continent, kind of paint the picture uh, uh, for everyone in this room as to the, the opportunity that exists with regards to energy infrastructure across, uh, say, Sub-Saharan uh, sub Africa? Can you want to narrow that a little bit? What kind of energy? Uh, uh, sorry, I, I apologize. I'm referring specifically to electricity. Nigeria is a unique case of market failure uh, on the electricity, uh, electricity front. I was fortunate when I joined the World Bank. That was my first assignment to go to Nigeria. Uh, the National Electric Power Authority, which was called NETA, the restructure. When I go to Nigeria, they say, no, it's not called the National Election Power Authority. It's called Never Expect Power Always. <laughs> 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 that's, that's Never. And the, the Nigeria has some of the richest people in the country. And you have two billionaires who uh, uh, cannot figure out in between the uh, port walls. They have to drive through portals to see each other. <laughs> and uh, there is no grid to connect electricity. Uh, uh, people can have adjusted in the journey that actually uh, diesel, because everyone is driving an engine, imagine at night. Uh, this is a, a car driving, it's, uh, that's what we call power supply. So every, everybody, and it's the most expensive electricity. But to build, like I was visiting in Nigeria, you know, they building the Eco Atlantic. So I, said, I went to see the 
the echo at Atlantic. So with the development there, there's a better chance of building a good legos, a reclaiming land, not mess around with legos the way it stands right now. So power, like anything else, depends on often, depends on other infrastructure. It depends on people who to use it. Nigeria right now, the hidden cost of electricity is higher than what people are prepared uh, uh, actually to do to organize Nigeria. They have called the discourse, they have called the uh, distribution companies, they have called uh, the went through privatization of the distribution companies. You have the theft of power is highest in Nigeria than in other, in other countries. So when you uh, generate, transmit, distribute, you distribute you maybe 60 percent. Some, someone is managing the distribution company, <laughs> but the money is going to a private account, and the, uh, so there is no sustainability. So if you are looking at Africa, uh, build. Africa, right? Look, energy, you got a better example here. Uh, these guys, uh, 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 infrastructure requires different ambassadors. Unfortunately, in Africa, we don't have credible ambassadors for the strategic development of the continent. It is uh, unfortunate. But if you look at Africa's development, you look at South Africa, which is the most developed uh, economy, which gives you hope. Here you got a few Englishmen and a few Dutch people. They came to Africa with no cash. Like, uh, like uh, you guys, you in school, some are like, you may not have paid. Or they went to Africa with an idea not to be poor. There were no roads, no electricity, nothing, like most of the African states. But what, they were, what were they good at? So if business schools taught you how America was built, how the rough barons played, who do things, because you come to this university, actually you fail to capture the opportunity that do gives you. That when you hear Duke, let's say, he go eventually into energy. Because mm -hmm. he knew tobacco is its own dangerous. And even under trust, the Sherman Act, they knew that if they, there was an issue of consolidation and the impact of market power. So they got into energy. And what was the motivation for it? And if you look at North Carolina, you look at this place. We find maybe three, four individuals who are responsible for, it, for building this. So when you look at Nigeria, the guys who, are the, uh, who pay more for electricity are not prepared to organize themselves. So it's very difficult for you from outside to invest in the country when people are accustomed to pay more. And they don't see that as actually eating into the future uh, of the country. So South Africa is with the highest white population in Africa. And the, the, some people were trying to look at the relationship between function system and white population. But wherever you have a white concentration of people, they don't want to be poor. In Africa, that's the experience. But we as blacks were accustomed to being poor. That is not really a, a, for you to be rich. It's not really a, an excitement uh, that it gives you anything. So organization starts from, from you. So that's why we came here when Martin said, look, uh, he, he had an idea of investing. I said, Martin, uh, in 1890, James Duke was 33 years old. He became president. Some of the students who are doing MBA, are not all of them, they are not, they have, some of them are 33, but they can't show for what they're doing. But these gems did not have an MBA. 
So when you deal with, you know, you're more enlightened, so money is in Nigeria today. If anyone can fix the energy problem in Nigeria, that's where the biggest gold mine is in Nigeria. Because you power the industry in Nigeria to connect a, just to have a life that you are, you are accustomed uh, to without diesel. In Nigeria it's impossible. So we are accustomed to switching electricity on and off, on and off. In Nigeria it's a luxury that people cannot really uh, uh, afford. So uh, like a road is the same thing. Uh, if you look at the railroad, just linking east and west coast of America. Look at the rubber barrels, the, the people who build the railroads. What really was different about those people? Uh, if you're building a road, a road you need cargo. If there's no car cargo, there's no value for, of, of, of that infrastructure. If you build a road and you only use passenger traffic, then it's of no value. So Africa has to have a different uh, leadership, uh, which is what I was negotiating with the Deputy Prime Minister uh, at lunch. I said, Deputy Prime Minister, uh, just uh, spend more time understanding why this place is called Duke University. Then you understand there was no government involved here. These were private people who understood the challenge of the time and built. So in Africa, we, we really look to you to uh, get uh, uh, my friend here. We can use him as a white friend. That's you mean <laughs> <laughs> and, and pretend we are very close to him. <laughs> People with money can feel comfortable. And <laughs> and the opportunities are there. It's just the three, the four of us here to organize ourselves. Uh, we will fight over who's going to be the president, who's going to be, who's going to be white, who's going to be black. This is too much. But, but if four of us came together and said, this is what we need to do. We can bring these pop stars, ministers, deputy prime ministers, or prime ministers. They come here, we confuse them, we say, we just need a concession <laughs> <laughs> to build a, a, a energy in Zimbabwe. Because all the people who are, who are building mines today in Zimbabwe, you know the biggest challenge is, it's not the mineral, it's energy. It's energy. Energy. Yeah. energy, you go from China, full of excitement. You come there, you can see the gold, but what do you do with it? You can't process it without energy. Then, if you can't process it, how do you convey it without fail, without fraud? So if you say to the Prime Minister, the future of Africa is in your head, and your head, for you to finish, and most of the successful entrepreneurs have no deeds, have no degrees. So that tells you something about wealth creation. That opportunities don't have to wait for you to say, I'm, I come from two, I come from the two, or whatever. I got an MBA. No, you are good employees. But uh, to convert employees into entrepreneurs, requires a lot of hustling, like uh, my brother here, he's a good hustler, he's a good hustler, so he's uh, the... Well, I think I'll get an MBA. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not, sure I'm not sure he's using the MBA, but, <laughs> but uh, he, if he can operate in Africa, he understands. We are talking about the governor trying to extort land from him if he does something. So he understands what the deal is. So that's where we, we so energy we got a big challenge. Infrastructure we a big challenge. But it's not the challenge of uh, uh, demand side, it's the challenge of the supply side. But on the supply side, we don't seem to have Africans who have the guts and the courage to approach capital markets and tell the African story properly. The people who are coming to Africa are looking for transactions, and there are many of them. So in the business of transactions, it's very difficult to move away from immediate cash to strategic 
investment that requires a different mindset. So we don't unfortunately have that. So we, I think we will need to work, even Zimbabwe, I think you, you saw the, the, I mean the, 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 the big prime minister. Uh, the, you are a platinum uh, license holder. You got a prospective order from the same company. Then you discover that after I buy the car, the car is now driving so well than before. Then I say, I want to change the contract. Can you bring back the car so that I will start talking? Then once you have that civilization, you know, you are what? You are finished. So I said to the Prime Minister, please, when you give me a prospective order, at the point of exchange, you are giving me a prospective order without knowing. Both of us are ignorant and we don't know what the mineral is, what the value of the mineral is. If I explore and discover value, whose value is it? I can, if the moment I know that if I discover good minerals, government is going to come and try to renegotiate, then I don't have an incentive to explore. Which means the resource will remain in the ground. Like many African states. A god left the minerals there, they're still lying sleeping. So for a thousand years, we are not the first generation to miss the wood. But for us as enlightened as we are, then we are not able to seize the opportunity to negotiate with the Deputy Prime Minister. But please, if you like Africa so much, respect your own contracts. Is a power session. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's what brings power. Yeah. Because if you if you if you want power, you want predictability, because it's a long term, it's a lump investment. So I'm putting capital today. And the return may take thirty years, forty years. So if I'm going to make a decision today, I must also be assured that whatever decision I make, there are not going to be new surprises on the target. There are not going to be new surprises on what? On access. So all these things are what we, as so I think uh, uh, you brought the deputy prime minister, so that we, when he goes back to cabinet next week, he can say, I met people in Duke, they are genuinely concerned about doing business in Africa. But they require honesty. You can't come here and say, you, you can't be a good politician in Zimbabwe. But here your career, imagine you take your career, you go to Zimbabwe and you say everything is okay. Then two, uh, two months down the road, he says you want to renegotiate your contract. And you have paid your bet, you, you have done this. There are human beings all over the world who have other things to do. So I think that is the negotiation we are trying to do. Right. I want to get, get back to this question about the energy and the infrastructure. We, we talked about some of these other panels about uh, good governance, and corruption, and all that. Uh, as impediments to doing business. Another big impediment is actually the cost per kilowatt hour, uh, which is very expensive because you've got to run your own generators. And it's a shame because a lot of these countries are energy rich. Um, you know, whether they have, uh, they could create biodiesel or they could do even nuclear because they have uranium. But a lot of them have oil. What do we do with the, you know, what do we, when, you, when you pump oil, you get gas. Um, and it's just a fact of life. What do we do with the gas? Nigeria is on that. We flare it. And why do we flare it? Because there's no infrastructure to do anything about it. And if you look around the world, you know, we're all talking about shale gas, LNG, and all these terms. Gas is a valuable commodity. Now, the last thing I want to find in Africa is gas. Why? Because it costs an absolute fortune to liquefy that thing and ship it. And even though it costs $20 in Japan, I don't want any gas. But if somebody would step up to the plate and would take that gas and pipe it into a, uh, a uh, facility to create power, a power generator, you know, all of a sudden you've taken something that is a waste product and you've turned it into something valuable. I do not see that happening in a good number of countries. The lead has been in the past, uh, has been from Western governments or multilaterals. Um, 
it will happen, there are no grids, um, and so forth, and it will be, once again, one of the, uh, the impediments to the business and will raise the cost of capital uh, in it. And it's, a, it, it's, it's a big problem. So, so you guys bring up a um, <coughs> very important point, which is actually the, uh, the central idea behind me, my master's project or thesis, which I'm working on right now, which is uh, people like Nigerians are six to ten times richer than they actually believe themselves to be because they're running diesel generators for the most part. And the most ironic part is the poorest people end up paying in Nigeria's case in 2005, about 80 cent, 80 naira per kilowatt hour. That uh, translates into something in the order of $3.20 per kilowatt hour. An American would never pay that. For a country that's on the coast that's flaring gas like exactly. crazy. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, obviously the obvious solution that Nigeria is looking to is so why don't we just build out a whole bunch of gas plants? But a whole bunch of those were supposed to come online by December 2013. The country still has, relatively speaking, about 4 gigawatts for 160 million people, whereas the developed country standard is 1 gigawatt per million people, meaning we should have 160 gigawatts of power. So there's opportunity. But besides corruption, can you speak to some of the factors that need to be in place so that when I call up Kent and I call up Bernardo and I say, let's form a company, let's go out into the world, raise capital and attack this issue. And build that power plant? Build it. What do we need to have in place to, be, to actually, because as the Deputy Prime Minister said today, I don't want to hear about problems, I don't want to talk about problems. So first person, first entity you go and see is OPIC. It's not OPEC, OPIC. Um, that's a government agency. You want to get yourself some political uh, insurance. Um, yeah, man. If you're American, uh, I, by the way, other countries. Right, other countries have uh, other different things, but I'm, I'm going to talk um, America first. And there are a number of other agencies, uh, Exim, uh, Millennium Challenge. Um, uh, yeah, there's, there's a number of other entities that you can talk. You can actually go to, uh, once again, IFC, World Bank, uh, a number of other different things to see if financing is available um, for a big uh, project. You're going to want to also get somebody who's seasoned on there. Uh, I believe I heard yesterday, I was at the, I mean Monday, uh, the Milken Institute is actually trying to promote their Africa thing. You can really see that Africa is becoming the flavor of the month, um, you know, when they're moving from U.S. private equity to Africa. And somebody mentioned to me, uh, a friend of mine, uh, the Symbian Power, that's been doing some things in, in Tanzania. Somebody told me that they were building a power plant in Nigeria. I don't know if that's, that's true. Okay. So, um, you know, I would, uh, and, and they're going to get funding from somewhere. But the trick in these cases is to get somebody somewhere to pay for it or some kind of public, private, and or the safest thing to do would actually to be uh, what the insurance companies do is have that government, Nigeria clearly has the money, put up some capital, some percentage, of which is now taken offshore as protection against if they do something, change the rules or whatever, against the contract, um, that you can clamp if they do something. The other thing about rule of law, wherever possible, you, you should do two things. Get a waiver of sovereign immunity. So if you're dealing with the government, um, they can tell you, oh, I'm a government, you can't enforce laws against me. Uh, you get a waiver of that. And the second thing um, to do is get a foreign law uh, because if it's a domestic law, um, look at Russian companies doing business in Russia. They'll find a judge in Siberia. You have lost that case before you start. So you can get New York law or London law or someplace, the UK law or something like that uh, to protect yourself. But, you know, there's money. The question is also the payout, what the hurdle rate is going to be. What are you going to discount that future cash flow at? Uh, and then you have all the corruption issues. You will get visits. Um, you know, it's you know, turn on the Sopranos and just <laughs> change the faces around. And, you know, this is you know what it is. Um, you know, it's unfortunate. So, so we talked about we talked about the opportunity that exists with uh, agriculture. We talked about the opportunity that exists in the energy space. I 
think a successful one um, um, or analog in Nigeria as an example has been the telecom industry, which the Deputy Prime Minister touched on. Uh, I remember going back to Nigeria uh, for the first time in um, two, about, about 2001 or so, and this had been years since I'd been out of the country, and there was, no one was really using cell phones and so on and so forth. And when I lived in Nigeria in 1998, I remember using the NITEL uh, mm -hmm. telephone mm -hmm. and such. Uh, three, four years later, the lady that sells plantain on the street, she's got not just one blackberry, but two blackberries, yeah. and she's topping it up with credit, which means that, uh, you know, these same people that are paying exorbitant prices for electricity or kerosene or, you know, wood, ETC, they are also, they also crave the ability to connect with people. They also crave the ability to run their business for a little bit longer. Um, or to have their child read their textbook at, like, at night time because they work during the day for a little bit longer. So can you guys just um, step away for a minute from the, all the things that are stopping us from doing what we should be doing and just paint what your vision, if you're successful in your different companies at doing what you're, uh, what you're there to do um, in terms of making your um, money while doing well. Uh, and if we're successful at doing that, what will, in let's say 2020 or 2030, what will uh, and, and, and Nigeria, Zimbabwe, uh, South, um, uh, wherever with more energy, more electricity, access to electricity, what will it look like? Um, everything else remaining the same. Everything else remaining the same. Yeah. No, you know, leave everything else out okay. um, with more access to uh, cheaper uh, food or more access to markets. Um, you know, just paint a picture of what the potential for these African countries. Cheap power is, I mean, it only happened in Nigeria. Look what the price of uh, natural gas here going down to uh, two, three, four dollars has regenerated the uh, petrochemical business. Uh, uh, plastics, believe it or not, are making a comeback because the price of ethane is practically zero. Uh, uh, businesses want to come back because it's not just the cost of labor, but the cost. You know, the cost of power in China is fifteen dollars per million BTU. Here it's you know three and a half or whatever. So uh, obviously you lessen an important input. You're going to see a benefit. So did you have anything to add? No, I think he just touched on all points. Um, yeah, the, the issue of power is critical to, to what we do. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> But without it, we, you know, it's the difference between 45 cents a kilowatt hour and 13 cents a kilowatt hour, right? And uh, running that for 24 hours uh, with the amount of power that we use, it's a little kill our business. So if, if you guys are ever, if you ever need a tool in terms of trying to measure one of the opportunities in Africa, if you just take that avoided cost that you just spoke about, the difference between for manufacturers and TC, the 45 cents per kilowatt hour and where you should be paying either 22, some say 13, that and you run it for a number of uh, hours. That is the size of an opportunity. I'm going to open it up to you guys to ask whatever point of question you have on this topic. Um, I've asked all of pretty much most of the questions that I would like to uh, ask. And please, please, when you ask a question, ask a specific question. It has a question mark at the end of the sentence. <laughs> questions as brief as possible. We have 15 minutes essentially to, to ask these questions. So my, my question kind of goes to you talked about how um, energy and infrastructure are, you know, could take on a public, private, uh, I, guess, I guess, form. How, how much do you think that relies on businesses? Because, you know, like Dan Gote in Nigeria, for example, has built a power plant on their own. How, how much do you think it, it is upon businesses to come in and tell the government, hey, we're will, willing to you know, build this road or build this power plant and fuel, you know, put some of the funding in versus the government just saying, you know, in order to attract businesses, we're going to build these roads. Well, I mean, it's part and parcel of, of the overall opportunity. Look at Asia in the 1990s. In private infrastructure was a huge business, big funds. And what did they build? They built toll roads. Um, they built a ver variety of different things that had a cash flow element to them. Um, and some of them were very successful, some of them 
worked. Uh, in fact, in, in Thailand, or Bangkok, where traffic is just horrific, uh, you can take the public road or you can take the toll road and, and pay. Um, it really comes down to a function of what you think um, you can make. I, I think because the investment in many of these cases is so large um, that a, a lot of investors won't feel comfortable uh, going in by themselves. Uh, and, and it's really specific in, in terms of the country. Um, if you talk about, let's talk about the mining industry and uh, let's talk about uh, where he is. Um, if you discover a large quantity uh, let's say gold, because gold is valuable, and uh, you'll get it to market and get to transport it or something like that. If it makes sense for you to build a road to get that to market, uh, to take advantage of the opportunity, you will do so. Uh, because it's economic for you to do it. Now, you first try to get the government to do it, uh, but the government may not have the capability uh, to do it. Not that they won't have the money, but they just, just can't do it. And so a lot of these mining companies or oil companies build their own infrastructure. It may make sense for uh, a big operation, an oil company, to build a, a small power plant um, for their own activity and then you know, give it away to the rest of the community and so forth. Um, so it's really um, dependent. I mean, Nigeria is, is, is a unique example because you have such a large population you have um, a relatively wealthy, compared to other countries, uh, population, uh, a large source, source of energy. So, uh, you know, that could happen. A lot of places, uh, if you're going to go to uh, Equatorial Guinea, which has half a million people, uh, but all the money is taken by one man, it doesn't work. If, if someone from outside of Africa is going to try to set up some sort of business opportunity or to establish some sort of power infrastructure project, what are my top three concerns for? It seems like we've addressed governance pretty strongly in corruption, but I mean, if you were to rank order top three concerns that would be in the top of my mind, again, what is your thoughts on that? Well, the country you've gone into extremely well. Also, have many, many moving parts. Um, you know, a lot of these are tribal communities so forth, depending upon where you're going, what you're doing, uh, understand that. Be aware of FCPA, the Foreign Corruption Practice Act. As an American, you should be number one on your list. Don't ever pay a bribe. Um, one, it will not work, and two, you will go to jail. Um, and a bribe can be something as simple as a kindle. And believe it or not, the government won't distinguish between a $10,000 envelope and a $200 um, So that's really important. And trust your gut in terms of who can I trust and who can I not trust. Because like every other business, everybody's looking for their mark. And uh, when you see somebody coming with money, they're going to try to, you know, screw it. But that's not to say that there aren't any opportunities. Find a powerful friend <laughs> internally. Uh, one of the challenges with the innovations and the entrepreneurship is the ability to access funding, to get funding. And uh, the reason, one of the reasons, is because the funders desire to invest a lot of money. And yet, this entrepreneur want to start small and then they grab the case to be able to expand. Now, how do we go about this uh, supporting the, the beginners, the entrepreneurs? Because, like you mentioned about the IFC, for example, uh, you might find it's very difficult for somebody who is beginning, might be having a brilliant idea, but he might not be able to sell. It's also true. I but if you have a, if you have a great idea, uh, I don't I don't think there's a shortage of money. Uh, I just think there's a shortage of actually good projects and good ideas. Uh, you just have to convince others that it's a great idea. Maybe a great idea in your mind, 
but if not everybody else agrees with you, then you're going to have a shortage of money. In fact, it's easier to raise a small amount of money than there is a large amount of money. Uh, you also would say a, the biggest problem is that you, you're looking at a project uh, as a way the promoter does not have capital in your case. Uh, and also the connection to market. Without a market, nobody will finance you need because you are converting money into products and then back to money. But the, while you are here, you have a, a unique opportunity to use this address. Uh, in New York and Seattle, a lot of people raise capital, but they are known to Wall Street. London is a big center of capital. Uh, what Simba uh, was saying, the connections that he had in the Wall Street, they come to aid when you are looking for opportunities. If I go to uh, SAP Miller uh, and I supply Bali, I want to grow Bali, and I invite the CEO of SAP Miller to a Duke University lecture on whatever Africa uh, things you want to do, you have a better chance of confusing him here than go to Africa to meet with him. They want the have time to meet with him. So you have uh, taken, uh, brought us here uh, effectively to build the case for yourself. And next year you should be more organized about where you want to go. Because we have no uh, opportunity of knowing what you are thinking unless you reveal it to us. Then we can be able to have access. As you are with your friend, Africa is in the valley. So there are more opportunities in the valley than other countries where other things have been tried. You can start from food. Telecommunications, logistics, well, look at that. Chain, I mean, look what he did. Right. What you did. So he didn't, it's not the money, but the opportunity. So on the demand side, while you are looking here, American television, American newspaper, America, you may actually die thinking America is the world. But there are many things that are happening outside the, the geography, too. Be part of that world. It's a dynamic world, and there are people who are offering those opportunities. So money is the last thing you want. You, you want. But with a secure market, with people who can give you that, like farmers in, South, in Africa, if I have a mine, and I've got 500 employees, I know those stomachs need to be fed every day. So it's a no-brainer for me to set up a farm just to supply one produce, but if I can't process it, it's not usable, and the sum is perishable, if I can't preserve it, so it means I have to value it, but without those two mines there, so as you look at all those mines behind, those mines that are opening up behind all these uh, 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 huge infrastructure investment, there are stomachs behind that, if that's what the future in prime is saying. I identify the need and the need is there. So money, I actually will give you money just because it was a project. I can, I can put together a project plan in my, in my head but without a tangible exit point for the output where somebody can pay and pay for more than what it costs you. Well, that will be part of his plan, obviously. But you need to secure the market. That's it. And the, most of the time, where we come short is that we don't have relationships in business and we don't cultivate the relationships in business. And this, so the qualification that you have is not an entry point to business, it's just one of what a, a goodwill factor, but it won't give you. So other people 
are doing more. So use your time here. You get, uh, you get. Uh, uh, we will try to arrange for some of the drivers and the checkers of parts of Africa to come and visit the uh, so that they come here uh, to take ten of them in a year, so that if you are Africa club, then you are exposed to the people who actually are doing something. Then, and you say you, you want to do a, a, a project to supply to them or buy from them, that will give you something more value. Also, want to get in front of as many people as possible, eventually somebody may say yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. But the law of numbers. Yeah. So this, <coughs> so this is what's saying at 415, but does anyone have a burning question that needs to be asked? Otherwise, um, you know, we will we'll wrap. Can I just ask what that money is to with the Green State Power Solar Dome? And I wanted to see what opportunities don't want money exist here for micro grid or small grid sort of on island opportunities or, you know, larger simple farm solar in Africa. There's a solar project that is going on in Rwanda that is backed, it's an Israeli, it's involved, and I know that... People um, want What? People want Okay, okay. So, and that's with, uh, uh, what's his name from uh, Time Warner, uh, two big shots, and also uh, S.T. Uh, Lauder. Um, anyway. They're, they're behind it. It's kind of a, uh, I don't know if it's a for-profit or a not-for-profit, but they're, they're doing something there. You know, the problem with solar, I mean, as you know, is, is that 